going to try and um, cover a fair bit of territory this morning, the date, the pharaoh, and the route of the exodus. I started putting this material together at about the same time that your Sabbath school class teacher, Paul, was talking about the exodus itself, primarily the date, and addressing the problem that archaeological evidence of the children of Israel conquering the uh, inhabitants of Canaan is scanty, and uh, particularly for the late date of the Exodus, it is essentially non-existent. In the process of doing this, I came across a lot of interesting information uh, by comparing a very recent translation of the five books of Moses called the five books of Moses, interestingly enough, by Everett Fox, a Jewish scholar of some considerable renown who has been very careful to translate each Hebrew word with an English word which he then stays consistently with whenever he runs across that Hebrew word again in the same narrative. So it's relatively easy if you just need to look up the, uh, the underlying Hebrew word once or twice and you can be assured that every time thereafter that that Hebrew word occurs, it'll show up as the same English word. Not true of um, most of our other translations, and that's why I find this um, much easier to work with when I'm looking at the underlying Hebrew. And then um, uh, a new English translation of the Septuagint. Uh, this is one of the books that was worked on by one of our, our faculty members here in the School of Religion, Dr. Bernard Taylor. And that, too, has turned up some very interesting textual information. But the question I want to address is, mm, there we go, um, what this narrative tells us about the nature of the biblical record. Because <clears throat> most of us, when we read this story about the Exodus, because it lists where the children of Israel started from and where they ended up, and those two locations on, in the Middle East are easy enough to come by, because it gives the starting point, the finishing point, and all of the steps in between, we immediately categorize it mentally as sort of a map quest description of how you would get from Loma Linda. Well, I guess Loma Linda is the promised land. Um, how you get from Los Angeles to Loma Linda. A map quest, a description of the highways that you would take and whether you would go north or south and how many miles you would travel on each one. Because that's what it looks like. But when you examine it in detail, it's clear <coughs> excuse me, that that isn't what it is. And so I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes or so trying to explore with you what the record of the Exodus actually is. It is not a map quest description of how you get from wherever it is you start to the promised land. The text. Exodus chapter 13, beginning with verse 17. Now it was when Pharaoh had sent the, had sent the people free that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, which is indeed nearer, for God said to himself, lest the people regret it when they see war and return to Egypt. So God had the people swing about by way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds, and the children of Israel went up armed from the land of Egypt. Now the first item of interest here is God had the people swing about by way of the wilderness at the Sea of Reeds. The Sea of Reeds in most of your translations will be translated as the Red Sea. The Hebrew word is clearly the Sea of Reeds. Nobody has any question about that. So when did it turn out to be the Red Sea? Well, the answer is 250 BC, when the Septuagint was translated from the Hebrew into the Greek in Alexandria, and I'm sure you know the story, 72 um, translators uh, all translated it separately, and when they got together, the translations were all identical. At least that's the story that's given in a letter that's probably three or 400 years later. We do know, however, that it was translated. And uh, the Septuagint is 
typically referred to in uh, biblical research as LXX, which for those of you that know your Roman numerals will know immediately it means 70. Nobody's ever explained to me where the other two translators went. But there were 72 translators, and they translated it from Hebrew into Greek. And at that point, they translated one of the references as Red Sea. And after that, all English translations have carried the term Red Sea. That will turn out to be very interesting in our future discussion about 10 or 15 minutes from now. Before we get to the route of the Exodus, however, I need to spend about 10 minutes on the date of the Exodus. Most authorities allow for two possibilities. There's a 13th century date somewhere around 1270 BC or a 15th century date somewhere around 1450 BC. First, let's deal with the 13th century date. The most um, a solid piece of evidence for this is something called the Merneptah Stela, because it mentions, it's, um, it's obviously uh, carved by an Egyptian pharaoh or on the order of an Egyptian pharaoh. This particular one happens to be the son of Ramses the Great. And we know what its date is. It was 12, it was, um, it was somewhere around um, 1200. And it mentions Israel as being in Canaan by that date. Well, if you know that 1220 is the date of the Menephtah Stele, and you add 40 years for wandering in the wilderness, you come up with roughly 1260 BC. In addition to that, in the Bible, it mentions Python and Ramses. Now, the city of Ramses is known, and it wasn't in existence at an earlier date. And therefore, the fact that the, it says they started from the store cities of Python and Ramses would seem to limit the date of the Exodus to somewhere around uh, 1260 or 1270. But there are problems with this. First of all, although the Bible mentions Ramses, it also, in 1 Kings 6, 1, says in the 480th year, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign. And we know again uh, fairly accurately when Solomon reigned. And the best scholarship it fixes it to 967 BC. Well, it just takes simple addition to say that we're 200 years earlier here, because that comes out to 1447. So the people that um, believe in a 1200 uh, or 13th century date counter by saying the Bible doesn't mean what it says, and 480 years is not literal years, but really means 12 idealized generations of 40 years each. On the basis of no evidence whatever, but that's how you get 480 years down to 240 years. You just simply say these are idealized generations. And this would place the Exodus at 1267, right in the middle of Ramses, which um, now everything agrees. The problem is, again, the Bible disagrees because it gives the generations from the time of David to Korah, who was one of the um, uh, uh, children of, of um, Aaron. So from Heman the musician, time of David, back to Korah, the time of Moses, there were actually 18 generations. So they weren't just 12, there were 18. First Chronicles 6, 33 to 37, gives the names of all the people in these 18 generations. And in Judges, Jephthah tells the Ammonite king that Israel had been living in the land for 300 years already. And this is still in the time of the Judges. So you see the problem. The Bible says they started from Ramses. The city of Ramses didn't exist at the time that the rest of the Bible seems to indicate they left. So this brings us to the evidence for a 15th century exodus. Well, it's biblical, except for that pesky text about the cities of Python and Ramses. Because, as I mentioned, the capital of Ramses the Great didn't yet exist in the mid-15th century, nor did Ramses II. He hadn't yet been born, and wouldn't be born for a couple hundred years. The city that is now being excavated as Tel El Daba was known as Roarty, later as Avarice, and still later as Perunifer. The city of Ramses, built later, is about one and a half kilometers to the northeast. And after the city of Ramses was built, because of the fame of Ramses the Great, he was, I think, the longest reigning pharaoh. He reigned for 70 years. 
He had something like 140 sons. Um, his tomb has been excavated, and um, uh, many of his children were buried there also. May have been the second longest. Um, there's second like longest. Pepe the first, or the second. Well, Pepe the first he reigned for an awful long time. But yeah, very long. <coughs> so uh, this is the city of Ramses on one of the branches of the Nile. And this is what is being excavated as Tel El Daba. But recently, in the last uh, 20 years or so, they have excavated palaces here which date to the time that the Bible uh, would indicate the, the exodus took place. And uh, there was a palace there. And if this is correct, then this would have been the palace that Moses knew um, at the time of the exodus and where the confrontation with Pharaoh took place. I'll come back to that palace in a moment because there's something very interesting about it. Further evidence from Joshua 11:11, 11, 11, the Israelites destroyed three cities by fire, Jericho, Ai, and Hatzor. Hatzor was indeed destroyed by fire, probably by Israelites, roughly 1230, and was not rebuilt. Since it was not rebuilt after it was destroyed by fire, if this had been done when Israel first entered Canaan, there would have been no Hatzor for Deborah and Barak to conquer as the Bible in Judges 4 to 5 records. So both Wood, uh, from whom much of the above is derived, and I'll give you the references in a moment, and Bill Shea, who is cited by Wood on the Pharaoh of the Exodus, agree on a 15th century date. I personally prefer the 15th century date, um, uh, partly at least because I think the eruption of Santorini, which occurred at around that date, got incorporated into the records because you remember there was a pillar of fire, a pillar of cloud, and the seventh plague was of rocks mingled with fire that hailed on the entire land of Egypt and destroyed it. And we do know that uh, ejecta from the island of Santorini did reach Egypt. Um, it's, uh, it's been identified and isotopically related back to the eruption of Santorini. But, the problem with that one is that Santorini at the moment is thought to have erupted the best date at present is 1628 BC, which is about 100 years too early. So no matter what you do, there's problems. So who was the pharaoh of the Exodus? I'm going to go with the 15th century date. No Egyptian record mentions plagues, Asiatic slaves, which is what the Israelites would have been uh, described as in hieroglyphics on inscriptions. And there's no Egyptian record that mentions plagues, Asiatic slaves leaving Egypt, or a pharaoh who drowned. Well, Egyptian history doesn't mention disasters of any sort. Every pharaoh did nothing but good, and every battle was won by the pharaoh. Now, we can't hold them to account for this very strongly. I remember as a child uh, in school learning about the wars between... Um, uh, between Holland and England, and where I learned about them, England always won all of those wars. As an adult, I had the privilege of traveling to Holland and looking in their museums, their maritime museums, and they mentioned the wars between England and Holland. And in Holland, all of the wars had been won by Holland, and England had been defeated routinely. So uh, the same sort of thing is going on today in history, and we'll come back to that because history is not a record of exactly what happened. It's a record of what somebody, the historian, interpreted from the data that was available to him or her. So Egyptian history doesn't give much evidence of anything negative. All records are of successful, all-conquering, pharaonic campaigns. An exodus in 1446, which would be the early date, would have been in the fourth year of the reign of Amenhotep II, and his mummy has been identified, and it's labeled. So my friend Bill Shea, um, Bill and I traveled together through um, the Middle East uh, with Siegfried Horn back in the 60s. Had a wonderful time. And actually, um, many of you may not know this, but Bill Shea, a graduate of the medical school at Loma Linda, was first trained as a surgeon. And he and I crossed paths when he was in his surgical residency. It was later in life he decided that the biblical studies were far more interesting than doing surgery. He went back and uh, got further training, and ended up as one of the three or four people in the Biblical Research Institute at 
and spent most of his life uh, translating Hebrew texts and traveling around the world looking at inscriptions. His explanation for why we have a, a uh, Amenhotep II's mummy is the following. And it's ingenious. Amenhotep II, the second, became pharaoh on the death of his father, Thutmose III. He was a boastful fellow, heart of heart. He was one who knew horses. These are inscriptions that we have of this fellow. He was one who knew horses. There was not his like in, it, in the numerous army. There was not one therein who could draw his bow. Now you know that, that um, the bows of these ancient heroes were very, uh, they didn't have the, the cam and the, um, and the pulley systems that we now have for bows. The bow was one piece of wood and you pulled it and, um, and shot an arrow. So the strongest men in the army had the, the, the bows that were most difficult to pull, and this pharaoh had the strongest bow, and nobody else could pull it. He could also run faster than anybody else. He could not be approached in running. Strong of arms, one who did not weary. Oh, he could also row. He took the oar. He rowed at the stern of his falcon boat as the stroke for 200 men. When there was a pause, the 200 men, they were weak, their bodies limp, they could not draw breath. Whereas his majesty was strong under his oar of 20 cubits long. 20 cubits long is roughly 45 to 50 feet. Now that is an oar. So these are the inscriptions about this fellow who may well be the pharaoh of the Exodus. He is a king, very weighty of arm. There is none who can draw his bow in his army. This is another inscription. Raging like a panther when he treads the field of battle, there is none who can fight in his vicinity prevailing instantly over every foreign country. Amon-Re, that is the sun god of the Egyptian pantheon, was loyal to him. That is, he was blessed by Amon-Re and could do no wrong. The strongest, the fastest, the most intelligent, the most brilliant, he was everything. Then, oddly enough, right in the middle of his reign, the royal palace was abandoned, and that was the palace that I showed you, the one where I said that Moses probably walked these halls. And there's no explanation given. There's none in Egyptian history to explain why the palace was moved to where the city of Ramses was later going to be built. The explanation that is offered, and it's a weak one, a plague appears to be the most likely solution of this problem, although it cannot be proven at this time. Did he die in a, in a massive defeat um, against um, the Israelites? Is his body, was his body never recovered? It's interesting that after this, this uh, relocation of the palace from where it was in the time of Moses to where it subsequently was, which is just a little bit further down the, the, uh, the Nile, about one and a half kilometers, the tone of the records of subsequent campaigns is much different from that of the early inscriptions. There's no arrogant boasting, nothing about the biggest bow and the strongest person. The records consist largely of a listing of the number of warriors and chariots captured along with weapons, horses, and jewelry. Is this the record of Amenhotep to be a pharaoh who had learned his lesson because his older brother or cousin or whoever it was was dead? We don't know. That's just a hypothesis. And, um, and Bill Shea um, actually got this um, printed and quoted in, in several archaeological journals. So there's the... Um, I think the evidence is probably suggestive that the exodus occurred around uh, in the 1550s before Christ and that Am Amenhotep II was probably the pharaoh of the exodus, but we don't know for sure. So now let's talk about the route of the exodus. How did the children of Israel get out of Egypt? What was the purpose of the narrative? Was it a map quest list of directions? Or is the story of the Exodus something that's quite a bit more important than a map quest? List of directions from Goshen to the promised land. Back to the text. Yahweh said to Moses, Come to Pharaoh, for I have made his heart and the heart of his servants heavy with stubbornness, in order that I may put these signs among them. And this is the reason the Bible gives for the story of the Exodus. I was intrigued by this. I don't know how many of you have read it, but this is what the Bible says 
the record of the Exodus was recorded. This is the purpose. And in order that you may recount in the ears of your child and of your child's child how I have been capricious with Egypt and my signs which I have placed upon them, that you may know that I am Yahweh. Now, your versions won't use the, won't use the word capricious. They'll say something like made sport of or toyed with. The Hebrew word there is, um, is one of those that we don't know anything about from any other source but the Bible. It's clearly something negative, and it, it, the, um, this is from the five books of Moses. He translated as how I have been capricious with Egypt, so that you may, do any of you have your Bibles open? What are the translations that you've got there for that? That's he, he, Exodus chapter 10, verse 2. Dealt harshly, okay. The, the, uh, it's known approximately what the, what the Hebrew phrase means, but um, the specifics um, are at the, basically at the choice of the translator. How I have been capricious with Egypt. In order that you may recount in the ears of your child and of your child's child how I have been capricious with Egypt. Okay, so now let's look at the story. We now know what the purpose is. It's not a map quest list of directions. It is something else entirely. Talking about the children of Israel, they moved on from Succoth and encamped in Etam at the edge of the wilderness. Now Yahweh was going before them by day in a column of cloud to lead them the way, by night in a column of fire to give light to them, to be able to go by day and by night. Yahweh spoke to Moshe. Moshe, saying, speak to the children of Israel that they may turn back and encamp before Pihahirat, between Migdal and the sea, before Baal Siphon, opposite it, you are to encamp by the sea. Now Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are confused in the land, the wilderness has closed them in. Let's take a look at the map. We know they started here. There's very good evidence that uh, the land of Goshen was in the eastern, northeastern part of the Nile Delta. We don't know what the Nile looked like uh, 2,500 years ago. This is a delta, and the Nile is constantly changing its, its, um, its pathway. In antiquity, uh, there were supposed to be seven heads of the Nile. Today, there are two, but um, don't take that literally. Um, the seven heads of the Nile had smaller and smaller versions, and as you, anybody who has looked at geology at all knows that these change constantly because the level is constantly being raised by all the sediment that's coming down the Nile. Since the dam was built at Aswan down here, very little sediment's coming down, so the delta is no longer being enlarged. But throughout all of antiquity, it changed. So this is the map that you'll get of the Exodus if you purchase the uh, heritage heritage edition of the It Is Written Bible, and it is after, somewhere up here it tells us, here we are, after F.M. Abel. So we know they started here, and we know that 40 years later they ended up here. Obviously the place to go is that way, but the Bible explicitly says they didn't go that way because the Philistines were here all along the coast, and this is the road to the land of the Philistines. So where did they go? Well, Abel says that what they did was that uh, Succoth, he doesn't list here, but he does have um, Pihahiroth here, Migdal, and Baal Siphon, and then they would have crossed down here. Ooh, I've lost my pointer. Do you have a, another one? No? Another pointer? Battery's gone. Uh, you can use the mouse on your... Uh yeah, I'll, I'll have to do that. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so we're starting here. Um, Piha Heroth is here. Belsiphon here. Migdal is here. Um, with Bill Shea, um, and um, um, uh, we, we sat actually on this mountain right here, looked across. These mountains are thought to have been um, Belsiphon and talked about the children of Israel crossing right here, which is the northern arm of the Red Sea. 
It's actually the northern arm of the Gulf of Suez. The Red Sea is Red Sea is down here at the south end of the you know, this isn't working either. Oh, there we go. Red Sea is actually down here. This is the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the eastern arm. This is the Gulf of Suez, which is the western arm of the Red Sea. This is the site of the traditional crossing. And um, uh, that's where we went uh, on this trip through the Middle East. And the, the Abel reconstruction is uh, pretty much what um, uh, the traditional site of the route of the Exodus is. But let me give you some additional information here. Yep, it's gone. Bihahiroth, Migdal, Balsiphon, and the crossing of the Red Sea. Paul lent me a video from um, a uh, person that some of you uh, may know, Ron Wyatt, who has um, explored here. He's a little bit um, crazy. He ended up um, be entering um, um, Saudi Arabia illegally. He got picked up, put in jail for 70 days. Um, but uh, he, has, um, he has the route of the Exodus as follows. He has, oh, I'm sorry. And this is Mount Sinai according to the traditional rendering. He has Pihahiroth down here. Now Pihahiroth up there or Pihahith down here, 140 miles between them. That's a lot of distance. And one of the big problems with his theory is that he has to get the children of Israel from the land of Goshen in seven days. So he's got to get them from here all the way down to here in a week. Um, and even then, he doesn't seem to have a week. Uh, he's he's, he's uh, talking about eating the bread uh, for a week. He says they traveled by day and by night, but to get six million, I mean three million people down there, 600,000 men plus women and children, flocks and herds, 140 miles in a week seems to me a little bit excessive. So that's Pihahiroth. He has Migdal down there too. And uh, that's Baal Siphon. And uh, he has a, the, the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea, not here. He has them crossing it from here to here. So let's go back. Many of you don't know, I, I wasn't aware of the fact that we actually have two complete records of the children of Israel's trek out of Egypt. One in Exodus and one in Numbers. How many of you knew there was another one in Numbers? Yeah, but you don't count. You're a, <laughs> you're a, you're a librarian. And, uh, <laughs> These are the marching stages of the children of Israel that they went on from the land of Egypt by their forces through the hand of Moshe and Aharon. Moshe wrote down their departures by their marching stages by order of Yahweh. And the children of Israel marched on from Ramses. Again, the same problem. They started at Ramses, a city which in 1500 BC did not yet exist, and encamped at Succoth. They marched on from Succoth and encamped at Itam, which is at the edge of the wilderness. And they marched on from Itam and turned towards Pihahirot, that runs along the face of Baal-Siphon and encamped before Migdal. Yes, the whole area. Uh, is it came to be known as Ramses in addition to the city. But Ramses, after whom it was named, wasn't born at the time that the children of Israel left Egypt. That's the problem, if the early date is correct. I think it is. The children of Israel marched on and encamped at Succoth, and then we got them down to Migdal. Now, you remember, Migdal is either on the Gulf of Eilat, or, I'm sorry, the Gulf of, of Aqaba, or the Gulf of Suez. Both of those are Red Sea. Exactly. Well, Migdal just means fortress. So. Yes, Migdal just means fortress. And the, the, and the e Egyptians had fortresses all along the border between them and the desert. So Migdal isn't much help to us. Pihahirat is going to be helpful to us. They marched on from Penei Hahirat, which turns out to be the same place, 
and crossed into the midst of the sea. Now this turns out to be a very critical phrase. Into the wilderness. Crossed in the midst of the sea into the wilderness. In the numbers record, this is the only mention that's made of the confrontation between Pharaoh and his army and the children of Israel. Just that one phrase. That's it. It's made a, a great deal of in Exodus. It is mentioned uh, not at all in this story. It just simply says, they crossed in the midst of the sea into the wilderness. Then they marched a journey of three days into the wilderness of Itam and encamped at Marah. They marched on from Marah and came to Elim. Now in Elim there were 12 springs of water and 70 palms and they encamped there. They marched on from Elim and encamped by the Sea of Reeds. Now that one is interesting uh, because um, in, the, in the Septuagint, that's where it says they, they left the, sea, the Red Sea and encamped by the Red Sea. So there's two Red Seas. They marched on from the Red Sea and encamped in the wilderness of Sin. Sin. So where are, whoops. This is, this is sort of the area where Bill Shea and uh, I am going to spend our time. Instead of going all the way down to here for the crossing, um, we're going to have the Sea of Reeds up here um, and have them cross right up here. Now that sea we know existed in the time of Moses and we know it was called the Sea of Reeds. It wasn't particularly deep. It's since dried up. But uh, there, was a, there was a channel of the Nile that came at that time, came across in here somewhere. We're not quite sure where. And we also know that the Egyptians had dug a canal all the way down here. Now, Piha Herat is, um, the, the Hebrew means the place where the sedge grows. But in the uh, Septuagint, it also talks about the mouth of Piha Herat. And Bill Shea's explanation is that this was the mouth of the canal. The canal, which was used for irrigation purposes, brought water uh, down and uh, dumped it somewhere into the, the vicinity of Lake Timsa, sort of like the Salton Sea. As you are aware, the Salton Sea is a man-made lake, and the water from the Colorado River that is used to irrigate uh, Southern California lettuce-growing area dumps eventually into the Salton Sea, which is below sea level and can't get out. This, this lake would have been above sea level, but barely. When the um, Suez Canal was cut through there, the Suez Canal is all at sea level. There are no locks. So all of these regions in here, uh, which have down through history had various and sundry amounts of water in them, although the Bitter Lakes have, have stayed pretty much where they are now. Lake Timsa, or what I take to be the Sea of Reeds, was right here. And I can't get my arrow back again. Hmm. All right. Well, Lake Timsa, Sea of Reeds, Piha Hero, mouth of the canal. Um, as I mentioned, in the Septuagint, it describes the mouth of Piha Hero, which um, was, I believe, a canal. They moved on from Elam. They came, the entire community of the children of Israel, by the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. They moved on the whole community of the children of Israel from the wilderness of Sin by their moving stages at Yahweh's bidding. They encamped at Rephidim. Amalek came upon and made war upon Israel in Rephidim. So we've now got to locate where Rephidim is too. Now you remember that before I started this, I said that this was not a map quest a list of directions on how to get from the land of Goshen to the Holy Land. And I quoted you a text here. And it was Exodus chapter 10 too. And in order that you may recount in the ears of your child and of your child's child how I have been capricious with Egypt and my signs which I have placed upon them that you may know that I am Yahweh. We now come to another text which is the other bookend of this story of the children of Israel exiting Egypt. They moved on from Rephidim, came to the wilderness of Sinai, and there Israel encamped. Now Moses went up to God, and Yahweh called out to him from the mountain, saying, and these are the texts that I'm interested in. You are to be 
to me a special treasure from among all peoples. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. That's the reason for this story. It is what historians would describe as a founding narrative of a people. It is how God brought them out of the land of Egypt, how he protected them on the way, and at the end, he had a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. The story was told to generations upon generations. As God had specified, it was told to the children and to the grandchildren and to the great-grandchildren and to the great-great-great-grandchildren as time went on. So I think that the Bible is fairly clear that that's the purpose of the narrative. Therefore, it doesn't really matter that we don't know where any of these places are. Uh, but it's still fun to speculate. So here's the speculation. And here's where we go. So Pihahirot was the mouth of the canal. Lake Timsa was the Sea of Reeds. There were Egyptian canals, which we know existed in the Middle Kingdom. And there's a, one of the forts, Migdal. Now, if you look at that line, and if you were Egyptian pharaoh, and if you had been invaded from the east by the people that lived in the east, and they kept coming in from this wilderness, you would fortify that whole region. You would put a whole string of forts up and down there where you didn't have a natural fortification, which would have been provided by the uh, lake. And so you probably wouldn't fortify the lake, but you would fortify everything else because you didn't want people walking in on you from. So here's uh, Pihahira, the mouth of the canal. The Israelites went north, then turned and came south again because uh, those canals would have been heavily fortified. And we actually um, know of at least two of those forts. I've listed uh, both of them up there. The one that's right up at the top there, Egyptian fort, is undergoing excavations at the present time. But the forts along this line of... Um, of uh, water where the, the um, Suez Canal now is, marked the, marked the difference between the inhabited land of Egypt and the wilderness beyond. And the Bible talks about they came to the edge of the wilderness. And then it says they crossed the sea into the wilderness. Now, if you think about that for a moment, crossing the sea into the wilderness would have to take place somewhere around here. Because the, all of the other places, you cross from here, you go across the sea and into the wilderness. If you cross here, you're crossing from one end of the wilderness to the other. Because all of this was uninhabited. And uh, Ron Wyatt's explanation is e even more puzzling because they've been in the wilderness for a week and a half before they cross. Question? Why go? Couldn't they just go around? No, because there's forts that down here, there's, there's a ring of forts. Come on. Nobody has a laser pointer I can borrow? <laughs> Where is it? Mine just, ah, there it is. I saw it. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Anyway, oh, here we are. Um, a ring of, uh, first of all, there's a canal here. And um, you've got um, flocks and herds that you've got to get through. But there is a ring of forts all the way up here. And they, that Migdal just means fort. Um, and there's this canal that runs up here that we know of. And there may also have been um, part of the Nile River here. So they didn't have much choice. It looks like they started to go up that way. And then the Bible says they turned back here. And it was here that the confrontation between the army and, um, and the Israelites occurred. And then they went uh, across into the wilderness. Um, Moshe had Israel move on from the Sea of Reeds, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They traveled through the wilderness for three days and found no water. They came to Mara, but they could not drink water from Mara because it was bitter. So we can actually identify the entire sequence of, of stages here if we can identify where there is bitter water. There are two lakes that have existed all the way through antiquity, and they are called the Bitter Lakes. 
They still exist today. The water is undrinkable. It's so bitter. So here are the bitter lakes. Here are the bitter lakes. Aha. Thank you. Here are the bitter lakes. They still exist today. The water is still undrinkable. It's still bitter. We know that they took them three days to get here, so it seems to me the simplest way to determine where they were and where they came from is to go back towards the land of Goshen three days journey. Three days journey back from the land of Goshen, that's just about perfect. They could easily, with flocks and herds, have made that journey in three days. So it looks to me like um, the, the evidence is strongly suggested that this is where they crossed. Three days journey they came to the Bitter Lakes. But we've got more that makes this reasonable. Um, about how far is that then? About something like 20 miles. Yeah. Uh, the, the other place down here is 140 miles uh, that they would have to have traveled in six days. Here they're traveling 20 miles in three. So Moshe had Israel move on from the Sea of Reeds. They went out to the wilderness of Shur. Now, it's this text, Exodus 15, 22, that is translated in the Septuagint, Red Sea. We don't know if the Septuagintal translators had some other texts besides the ones that we have today. It's possible they did. It's possible they had additional manuscripts, which have since been lost. And those manuscripts may have said Red Sea. But all the manuscripts that we have access today when it talks about this here, it's Yam Suf, which is Sea of Reeds. And our, our, our Bibles have translated it Red Sea um, for traditional reasons. The, the Hebrew word doesn't say anything about red. They came to Mara, but they could not drink water from Mara because it was Mare. It was Mar, bitter. Therefore, they called its name Mar. And so. Um, you can give some idea of the distances. The distance from there to there is 140 miles. The distance from um, wherever the, these lakes were uh, down to here is, well, it depends on whether they went straight to the upper edge or came down to the middle, but we're talking about 15 to 20 miles. It's not a great distance. The Egyptians pursued them and overtook them, encamped by the sea. All of Pharaoh's chariot horses, his riders, his army, by Piha Herat, the mouth of the canal, and before Baal Siphon. Nobody knows where Baal Siphon is. There is one inscription that Bill Shea was able to come up with. It's on the wrong side of, of the canal, but it is down in this region. The column of cloud moved ahead of them and stood behind them, coming between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. Here were the cloud in the darkness, and there it lit up the night. The one did not come near the other all night. So, um, where Bill found the, the reference to Baal Siphon was over here somewhere. We're assuming it's over here because it says that they were to encamp here opposite Baal Siphon. Moshe had Israel move on from the Sea of Reeds. Whoops. And uh, here's, here's how they get to Mara. And that journey is easily accomplishable in three days with however many their children of Israel were. Now, you know the Bible text gives them 600,000 men, which we assume translates into something like 3 million. But there is no evidence archaeologically of anything like that number of people traveling through here. There are no sources of water, and there is no evidence archaeologically of encampments or any, anything else. I will show you in a minute where there is some evidence. It's still not great. They came to Elim. There were 12 springs of water and 70 palms, and they camped there by the water. An interesting text. They moved on from Elim, and they came, the entire community of the children of Israel, to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. Um, Bill's suggestion is that this is Elim, uh, because there are, in fact, date palms, which the Bible says they were, says they were date palms, 70 of them. There's a lot more now, but presumably in 
2,000 years, they could have multiplied the date bonds. There's still roughly 12 wells. And the interesting thing about this is that in the text in, in uh, Numbers, it says that they camped by the Red Sea. So um, what Ron Wyatt did, and I don't know if I can, well, before I go there, um, they, from Elim they went to Sinai. Now, we don't know where Sinai is. Um, if, if the traditional Mount Sinai is down here, um, the, the other Mount Sinai is over here. Why don't we know where Sinai is? Well, the first, the first uh, record that we have of the traditional Mount Sinai, which is Jebel Musa, and it's down south of where we are on this map, it's right here, dates back to Constantine. Constantine uh, became emperor, uh, became a Christian, I think, in 312? Hmm? 321. And he sent his mother... He, he, he apparently had visions of where the Mount Sinai was located. He sent his mother, and she located from his description Mount Sinai here, built a church. 200 years later, um, a, a um, uh, monastery was built there, and that's why we uh, assume that this is Mount Sinai. And that's why the traditional route of the Exodus comes down here. So this is why Abel has, um, the fellow that wrote this, has... Uh, Pihahiroth, Migdal, Baal Sipon, Elim down here, Mara here, um, and then Rephidim has got to be somewhere down in here. But that's pretty poor evidence. That's 300 years later. Um, I'm sorry, 300 years after the time of Christ, uh, which would have been, um, what, 2,000 years after the uh, incidents at Sinai occurred. And there's an interesting text in our Bibles in Galatians where Paul mentions Mount Sinai in Arabia. Well, is this Arabia? Uh, this is the reason that Ron Wyatt puts Mount Sinai somewhere down in here because this is Saudi Arabia here. That's the problem. Uh, it, was this just a slip of the tongue when Paul was mentioning Sinai in Arabia? Or was, did he know something that we don't know and that the, the, the real site of Mount Sinai is somewhere over here? The other possibility is that uh, the Roman province of Arabia may have included this. May have included this, and that's one of the usual explanations. Now, the interesting thing is that there is a fair bit of archaeological evidence of people at the time of uh, 1500 BC moving through this land. And there's a lot more around here than there is around here. There's essentially nothing here. There's a lot here. And we know that Moses spent his time when he was not in Pharaoh's palace here. That we're fairly sure of. This is the land of Midian where Moses met his wife, spent 40 years, uh, and, um, and uh, it's highly likely, it seems to me, that he came down here and then took the children of Israel down to here. But I don't really know. The only one I've been to is this one because this one you have to get permission from Saudi Arabia to get into. Does the word also refer to a, mount, a range of mountains, the Sinai? Is it a range? Or? No. No? You know, Sinai is, is, the, is the site of giving of the law. So the, the traditional mountain here is called Jebel Musa. How many of you, by the way, have climbed it? A class like this, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, five of you have climbed the mountain. That's, um, that's what the privilege you get teaching uh, Sabbath school lessons in Loma Linda. Almost everywhere on earth <laughs> you mention at least two or three of your class members have been there and can argue with you about what it looked like. <laughs> keeps okay. you honest. There, yeah, it does. It certainly <laughs> keeps you honest. There are, my, there are the references. Um, uh, Shea, Wilson, Wood, Bryant Wood. I'm relying primarily on, on Bill Shea and on uh, Bryant Wood for um, all of this, plus my own observations when I was privileged to travel through here with Siegfried Horn. And with that, now that we've got the children of Israel, um, see, there was, a, in antiquity, there was known to be a, a, an ancient caravan route from here all the way across to here. So it wouldn't have been too difficult for them to just follow that. They didn't need to go down here into the trackless wilderness. So they could have easily gotten here and down here. 
which is where Moses' father-in-law lived, where his and you remember that shortly after this, Moses' father-in-law shows up in camp. Now, I, you know, obviously he could travel from here to here, but if Moses happened to be in the vicinity, <laughs> it would be a lot easier for him to come pay him a visit. And this is where he gave advice to Moses on the fact that he was spending too much of his time in administration. And he needed to get on, I guess, with writing the five books of Moses. With that, I will cease and questions. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. I'm uh, curious about, you mentioned Wyatt yes. and his uh, discovery. Now, he has claimed that uh, they are, uh, that he discovered the wheels of the uh, Pharaoh's chariots. It's in there. And that he also discovered the, the, uh, the ark containing, the, that's supposed to contain the Ten Commandments. And he made a whole bunch of discoveries. Mm -hmm. Uh, on one occasion, I asked Dr. Taylor, I said, can this be possible? <laughs> and he laughed. He says, if he made one of those discoveries, it would be very exceptional. But all of them, by one man, <laughs> can't be. Yeah. Would, would you care to comment? On <laughs> well, as I told you, it's a fascinating uh, video. Um, and uh, I enjoyed looking at it. Um, Paul provided it to me, and I had never seen it. I have listened to Wyatt talk and kind of dismissed it because I would agree with Taylor. If he had discovered one chariot wheel from uh, the 18th dynasty times, uh, he would be one of the most famous biblical archaeologists around because it would be the only bit of evidence, solid evidence, that we have that, that um, the exodus occurred. No archaeologists have ever been able to follow in his footsteps and find anything. So the, the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia took a lot of his findings, uh, uh, claimed findings, in Saudi Arabia, and they fenced them off and put a guard tower there to keep other people from messing around. But um, they sent archaeologists out there to look to see if there was anything um, commensurate with what he claimed. And they. Maybe uh, he would say they, they didn't want to, va to validate the story of the Exodus. Uh, but that wouldn't be true for the chariot wheels because they're not in the Saudi Arabian kingdom. Yes, I know. I've seen the pictures. And there's good reason to believe that many of those pictures were uh, not filmed where he said they were filmed. <laughs> I... Uh, I hesitate, in fact, will not get involved in discussing Ron Wyatt because I met the man, spent 12 days with him in Jerusalem and had a very close, intimate opportunity to evaluate him as a human being and as a scholar of the Bible. As a scholar and as a witness for what he has seen and verified himself, I can just say that he proved to be wholly unreliable. <laughs> but as a Bible student, knowledgeable about the Bible, he was plain remarkable. He, before I even decided to, to join him in uncovering the Ark of the Covenant, <laughs> I mean, this was going to be... See why I hesitate to teach us our school lesson. <laughs> 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 no. Blame Paul. He was Perhaps the one. <laughs> this is a digression. It's not from no, the No, go ahead. The Let's talk about the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, he, he not only knew exactly where Noah's Ark was, of course. That's, oh, yes. That oh, yes. That's where I first met him. He cut his I was also Noah's. chasing the Ark <laughs> at, at Ararat. He was staying in the Hotel Ararat in the town of Dobayazit. I was just one block away in the Hotel Noah. You see, that town makes, makes a living out of hosting searches for the ark. No, um, I happened, after the disappointment and there was no ark of the covenant, 
he took a group of us, the whole team, 11 professional people, I was just one, and the only other Adventist in the group. I had, before going, I had uh, verified the man's trustworthiness by telephoning the conference office in Kentucky, Tennessee. I knew he was a member there. I wanted to know what his local reputation was. And I was told that he teaches a very popular Sabbath school class. He had done that for many years. There are many people who do not agree with him. But nevertheless, you can be sure that what he says as fact, he thoroughly believes in himself. <laughs> now, is this self-delusion? I don't know. But on this trip, the two days after the, big dis the great disappointment, we went, all dozen of us, with Ron Wyatt at the wheel, driving from Jerusalem down. He was going to show us not only Qumran and the other uh, interesting places, Masada, amongst them, down uh, near the Dead Sea, but on the way down on this busy highway, weaving his way amongst camels, herds of goats, lots of trucks, and a very l a great lot of heavy traffic, driving rather fast in a packed van, one of the voices near me, near the back of the van, spoke up loudly and said, Ron, would you explain to us, please, what Adventists teach about the end times? Now, that's a big question. He was asked, while he was driving in this precarious route, to explain uh, what Adventists teach about the end times. <laughs> well, I could not have answered that question in a coherent way. But Ron Wyatt, busy though he was, set out and he must have spent 20 to 25 minutes giving a magnificent survey of the great controversy starting with a conference amongst the Godhead before creation and going right through the through millennium. The man could quote verses of scripture that just was remarkable. And the, and the circumstances in which he was talking were apocalyptic, if nothing else, because yes, they at were. any moment, <laughs> all of you <laughs> well, could have been I'm, obliterated from the face of the earth. I, I'm sorry, this is indeed not relevant to our <laughs> discussion today, except that from that day on, respecting his knowledge of the Bible and his ability to teach it, I resolved the man is misguided, but I am not going to badmouth him, except that ever since that time, I've been hounded by his followers and disciples challenging my disbelief. So, uh, all right, <laughs> there you go. Uh, all, uh, Thank you. Um, that, that's, the best, that's the best apocalyptic story I've heard. <laughs> Who, who's next? Oh, there you are. I was wondering about, uh, it, was Mount, it was Lake Timsa? Lake Timsa or Sea of Reeds, yeah. Where that canal was, did you know the topography? Because uh, I understand they were hemmed in. Yes. All around, they could not go back. Or they they were... Go they could not go back. The reason that um, there are two reasons given. Um, uh, Bill Shea's explanation is they were, they were caught between this canal and perhaps one of the, the mouths of the Nile that was dumping into this sea on one side and then the ring of forts on the east. And so they were stuck. We don't know where Baal Sivan is. We don't know whether it was a mountain or a fort. or um, But uh, nobody's ever been able to locate it. The other site for the crossing of the Exodus, which is right down here, there is a mountain range that comes right in here. So if they were coming down here, uh, they would be stuck right here. And um, uh, I was sitting with Bill Shea on a hilltop here um, with Siegfried Horn, and we were looking at this and looking at the mountain. They're definitely, so he said, that's got to be Balsifon, and it has to be the name of a mountain. We don't know what Balsifon was. Never. It doesn't occur anywhere else in any inscriptions. The Bible is the only reference. So we know it's something somewhere close to here. But that's all we know for sure. Yes? I, I note with a little bit of surprise that uh, you have two large, from, from what I understood, 
Uh, speak into the mic, please. Those little lakes that say Pithom is yeah. where the Sea of Reeds was? Yes. But I see that this map shows Sea of Reeds, this big, <laughs> big arm here, yes. and another big arm right. over here. Yeah. So uh, this is able. It seems like this is able. They wanted to make sure they covered all the possibilities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is um, this is Sea of Reeds. This is the the uh, northwestern arm of the Red Sea. This is the northeastern arm of the Red Sea. This is the Red Sea down here. And the question is, um, now remember I told you that the, the story in, in Numbers, and I didn't realize it until I started looking at this very closely, the story in Numbers talks about two seas. And they are several days' journey apart. After the children of Israel left, and I think they came across the Sea of Reeds here, and then they came down to here. It says they encamped by the sea. Ron Wyatt says they crossed here, went inland, then came back out again. And and camped by the sea. Um, if you look at the, at the record in Numbers, it talks quite clearly about camping by the sea, going through the sea, and then camping by the sea. I think it makes much more sense to have them go through here and camp here, but that's a uh, personal opinion. We don't, know. <laughs> we don't know where the exodus took place, and yet we've got a listing of every single stopping place all the way along. Um, there, according to the traditional uh, 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 I think that uh, Push the I, silver button. Oh, the silver button. Yeah, I think that we have actually them camping by the Red Sea right in here, which okay. would be, of course, also by the Red Sea. They would have crossed yeah. here and then gone here. I'm not sure that that differentiates the two routes enough to be able to say uh, that one's better than you the other. You mean this one. route and this route, or uh, this route and this the one? The traditional one and the route you're proposing. Well, it, it do does kind of make it a little bit easier to understand than Ron Wyatt's proposal. I think that's yeah. probably fair. Fair enough. Yeah, there are these two camps, and you're, you're quite correct to bring that out. Two, uh, two quick questions. Number yeah. one, what made the water then and now bitter? What makes it bitter? I have uh, no idea. But it is bitter. They're salt? Cold? Is it very high yeah. content it's, of it's salt? It's got a high salt content. But it's all over. It's the same thing. Any any sea water is salt. Well, this isn't a sea. This is a this is a uh, a freshwater right. lake from. Um, well, right now, of course, <laughs> um, the Suez Canal goes right through it, so it is seawater now. But back in antiquity, it was water came down here, and eventually ended up um, from one of these mouths of the Nile. In fact, if you look here, there's something called Crocodilopolis. Crocodilopolis. <laughs> I wonder why it was called that. <laughs> And there was a tributary of the Nile that fed it. That's now gone completely. It's just dry desert right there. The, the other question could be speculation. Um, the Lord had 10 plagues in there. He showed uh, uh, Israel. He showed Moses his power. He could have had them these guys march straight through Philistine and blindfolded the Philistines. But he chose to get them this way for 40 years. And we're told Underline. that the Lord said to himself, yeah. this phrase has always intrigued me. You have the Lord discussing matters with himself. He said, I don't want to send them that way because they'll get scared and turn back. And I want to be sure that I get them out of Egypt and into the promised land. So after consulting with himself, he sent them south instead of due east, which would have made a lot more sense. They could have gotten from here to here in, oh, probably three weeks, two and a half weeks instead of 40 years. Before we go on to the next question, I need to note that it is 11.30, and I know some of you have other places to be, so. Yeah, not a question, but a comment. This is excellent. I agree with the bottom line conclusions. I've known Bill Shea for a long time, for three decades or more, and he's an extremely thorough scholar. And He's an Egyptologist, by the way. He can read the Egyptian inscriptions, which not many Adventists can do. Dr. Horn could do that, too. Bill Shea can find inscriptions, too, where nobody else can. Well, that was late in life, <laughs> and maybe, maybe there are other factors for, for that. That's another story. Um, back to Sandra's comment, which is excellent, because I've grown up with the idea that Ellen White in vision saw the route of the Exodus, and so we could 
kind of pipe into some of her visionary language and be able to reconstruct it. Um, there's a bit of a problem that I encountered when I was working at Ministry Magazine and Walter Ray's findings became known about Ellen White relying on other sources. So I went to her library, much of it preserved at the White Estate and pulled books off the shelf. And I also have gone to other libraries because we could reconstruct what library Ellen White had, 1,200 volumes. She had a huge study for library. For that time and place, she had a huge library. Huge for that she day and age. She had a better library than most of our early colleges exactly. and universities had. Probably Jan Andrews was the only one that had a comparable library of our pioneers. It's amazing the number of books that she had on historical geography. And there's enough sec um, primary evidence from letters to show that in her correspondence with her assistants, she needed those books to put the visionary uh, scenes that she had seen, to put them into a physical uh, environment. So she was relying on the physical geography books on the route of the Exodus, as it was known a hundred and some years ago. And we can take those books and trace it, and sure enough, her language matches those books. Um, I'd like to go back to the primary source. These are secondary sources. Primary source is Exodus 14, where the Lord is speaking to Moses. So this is, comes direct from the Lord. Tell the Israelites to turn back in a camp near Pi Ha Haroth, which is by Migdal in the sea. And then the reason is Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion hemmed in by the mountains? No, hemmed in by the desert. Now this is the Lord observing the route that he knew they were going to take. And he's saying that Pharaoh will know that you're trapped by the desert. I can't find anywhere in the Bible that it says that um, the Israelites were trapped by mountains. So maybe... Uh, Hi, thank we, you. I, we I, may I, have to date that to 19th century thought rather than I, uh, I was scripture taking itself. Siegfried Horn's observation that Baal Siphon was probably this mountain range. And ever yeah. since then, I've assumed it was a mountain range. I have too. And my dad taught that too, and he taught archaeology. The desert doesn't mean that I don't think that him saying the desert does not rule out mountains. There could be mountains in the desert, and he did not <laughs> specify. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't. Get her information. That's the question. Yeah, well. Yeah, we, she, she talks about them she, being hemmed in by the mountains. She does. Very clear patriarchs and prophets. But okay. you're right. There are mountains in the desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess Go ahead. you've just added one little bit to my, my comment, and that is oh. there's always a possibility that she actually had information that, that, that we don't have access to. But anyway, I... Just wanted to comment that one of your points is actually is based on an assumption. That is the assumption that there were not any other bitter waters except the bitter lakes. I mean, that, that's an assumption. And I, I think I, I enjoyed your talk, and it illustrates something that you said, in fact, that the, the question of the route of the Exodus is very speculative. No, I, I'm, I'm not assuming that there aren't any other bitter lakes. I was just looking for something three days' journey. Um, from, from Goshen, basically. Because it says that they, they, they left the land of Goshen and encamped at Succoth, and the desert was in front of them. So we assume that they had come to the borders of Egypt and the desert. And from there, three days' journey, I'm looking for bitter water. Well, uh, this is just too good to pass up, but you're quite right. There could have been bitter lakes, and there probably were all the way through the desert. Yes? Can you... <clears throat> Can you show on your map where the current uh, Suez Canal runs and how much of this area is actually destroyed as far as archaeological purposes? Uh, the Suez Canal, uh, this, the, um, the ocean part of it doesn't look like this anymore, uh, but it runs down through here. But the Bitter Lakes are still present? The Bitter Lakes are still present. The Suez Canal runs right through them, but the, it's, it widens out. The, 
What so, about this, the sea of reeds that you no, mentioned? Sea of that reeds, there's desert? no sea of reeds here. Um, the, the evidence for this is all archaeological. It comes from coring the desert and looking at the uh, soil layers. They know that at one time there was water there. How deep it was, we don't know, but it clearly grew reeds. There, there was a map of this area from the time of Tutmos the first through Tutmos the third, which does show water in that particular area. Yeah, oh. yeah they're, they're definitely, we don't know how big it was because they, you know, archaeologically it's not been of any great interest to trace its extent, but we know, it, they, we know there was a lake here. And the, the, um, this is the, the region, the Suez Canal. It's all, it's all sea level. The Suez Canal, they just dug a ditch. Now, I, yeah. I, I do, uh, I would point out one other thing, and that is that um, right now there is some digging in the area up in here, yeah. um, uh, where they think that Mount Sinai may have been. Okay. <laughs> And, and it apparently has some archaeology associated with it in terms of uh, right debris there. from people who were there at one point. And uh, so there are, there are a lot of people who are, who are really trying to hunt for, and they're not buying this one, and they're not buying this one, and they're looking up in here. Uh, so <laughs> there, are, there are all kinds of theories out there. What would be really nice would be to find some yes. pottery uh, shards from the era, whatever that era was. Whatever that era was. That would probably tell us whether the 15th century or 13th century. Or, or 15th century, but, uh, but perhaps 12th dynasty or 13th dynasty. Okay. I think. Uh, I'm wondering uh, how solid is that uh, location, Goshen? Because uh, in the midst of that delta there, it seems to me that deltas grow a lot over the years. It's a lot of years. Um, I'm not uh, knowledgeable enough in, as an Egyptologist, but I'm told that there's no doubt as to where Goshen was. And I think that's because there are actually stele or inscriptions that describe it. Part of this land was actually given to the priests of Amun-Ra, and it was one of the most fertile, if not the most fertile place in all of Egypt. And so the, the borders of what was uh, deeded to the priests and the, the location in Goshen, I think is fairly well known, but maybe we have somebody who knows this for a fact. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, is Goshen really Goshen up there? Um, we know that uh, during the Hyksos period, all the pharaohs had their palaces there up in the delta region. It was some, somewhere they were, uh, yeah, right, right up Semitic, in region. They were Semites, non-Egyptian by ethnic uh, race. And when Joseph went to Egypt, he went possibly during the Hyksos period, or at least uh, there are some connections. Secondly, um, this new site that you mentioned, um, the... Um, Next to Ramses, yes. that Vitok, Manfred Vitok, I forget the name of it. That site has been thoroughly excavated, and it has a unique structure of a four-room house, Which as I understand. Typical of the Israelite houses. And when you find the first Israelite houses in Palestine, they're called four-room dwellings, and they fit the blueprint very, very nicely. Um, and they're actually called by ar archaeologists the Israelite houses, the four-room homes. They're so unique. They're only here in the Delta, and then they're up in Palestine. So that kind of Goshen, draws a... Goshen's out here somewhere. It kind of draws a dotted line between oh, and, and that the Delta if, area if, <laughs> if and If all of these other suppositions are correct, it would have been this place that Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh confronted right. each other. And I think that's probably true. Okay, we've got one vote for this um, proposal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is uh, tangential, but, uh, you know, it has to do as to the correct way of interpreting scripture. 
you made reference to the fact that uh, to the verse that says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh in order to show his power and Paul uses this uh, you know in support of his idea that God is sovereign he can do he can be fair he can be unfair and we have no way to argue this uh, I wonder if how do you read scripture you know, are we supposed, because there are several, I counted a whole bunch of instances where it says God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and then it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. So, it, to me, logically, there is a contradiction in the Bible, and I have no problem with that. But many Adventists think that I am an infidel, using infidel arguments. You bring up a very interesting point, and I touched upon it, as to whether or not this whole story's purpose is that of a map quest list of directions on what freeways you take to get from Goshen to the Holy Land. And clearly, if that's its purpose, and we can't find any of the intermediate steps, it has failed. If, on the other hand, its purpose was to be told to the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren and serve what historians would describe as the, the, the uh, become the founding narrative of the nation. It would serve the same purpose that founding narratives of our nation serve. It is unlikely that George Washington ever chopped down a cherry tree, but that has become part of the founding narrative of the United States. I'm quite sure that the stories that we hear about the Voyage of the Mayflower aren't a ship's log record of what they did on each day, but in fact they have come to be part of the founding narrative of this nation. And Thanksgiving, they are highly unlikely to have been outdoors eating corn fritters on November the 25th. They were lucky if they had any food at all. but. <laughs> The story of Thanksgiving is part of the founding narrative of the United States. And that's true of all nations. The, the, uh, if you think about um, the founding narrative of communist China, a very large part of it was something called the Great March that went on for uh, where the, the, the armies marched from place to place, under, underwent great hardship. That's what this story is recorded for, and whether we can trace exactly where they went or not is of much less importance than the fact that it produced a nation which still exists today, and a nation that wrote of God and his mighty acts in human history. And our minds sort of say, well, if they're going to tell us where they started and where they ended up, it's got to be scientifically accurate at every stage in between. I mean, it may well be scientifically accurate, but we don't know where any of these places are now. And we're guessing, and somebody brought up the point that I'm placing a great deal of reliance upon Mara and bitter water, and I am. That's where, as a scientist, I'm starting and I'm working both ways, up and down. I know that's what I'm doing. Is that correct? I don't know whether it's correct or not. Makes sense to me, and it's interesting for discussion, but I would make no claim about how likely it is to be correct. Um, referring to that uh, founding narrative uh, concept that you have, it's very interesting to me that that is also uh, applied in other senses. Um, it, it, I'm reading Isaiah right now, and uh, he's applying it to the exodus from Babylon at the end of the captivity. And it's also applied as the last days when, when we are to come out of Babylon, this Babylon now, and uh, I suppose eventually the exodus from the earth. Um, but I think that's, that's a very interesting thing, that it is not just about the children of Israel. Um, and and I, I like that, that parallel idea. It's not only not just about the children of Israel, this has become part of the founding narrative of all people. Fascinated me uh, one week they were talking about uh, floods in um, Far East and uh, in the 
east in the United States not too long ago. They kept referring to them as floods of biblical proportions. Well, yeah. just what is a flood of biblical proportion? This is these stories are part of our history too, particularly that. And so Exodus and Pharaoh and let my people go free. It's gotten into Negro spirituals. It's it's part of the founding narrative of pretty much everybody who claims to be a Christian. So this is a very important story. And I don't know that it matters that we can't tell you precisely where Succoth was or where Elam was or where Mara was. Um, I like to, it's, it's fun to try, but it is part of us, all of us, and it's particularly part of the Hebrew nation and made them what they were. I have one unrelated. One, yes. <laughs> Not an unrelated question. Uh, I have been told that there is no evidence of those millions of people going through the desert and all that stuff. And I'm wondering what kind of archaeological evidence would you find, would you expect to find from people who are camping in tents and, and traveling from place to place for 40 years in the desert? You would expect to find evidence of um, sheep poles. Uh, the stones should have been arranged so as to, you know, if they camped at um, one of the places for 30 years or 20 years or something. Yeah. Method in ref no, not the rest of it. up. Yeah. And you would expect that if they spent, if they stayed there for 20 or 30 years, that they would have rearranged the stones in the desert to make it more convenient for their flocks and herds to stay put. Um, you would expect to find pottery. Uh, you would expect to find trinkets, uh, trinkets, uh, clay seals, or something. Uh, that large a number of people moving through the desert, particularly places where they stayed for weeks or months, you would expect to find evidence of um, archaeological evidence, for instance, that there were pastures there that the uh, sheep could, could eat. Um, I, I asked, <laughs> I see Prehorn, did he really think there were three million people crossing? His answer was interesting. He said that um, El Moy mentions that there were three million. He said he thought that what she saw in vision was a large group of people, and then she went to the Bible to find out how many there were. And that biblical text, a translated thousand, six hundred thousand, is always is also translated as a um, a band, a family band, large enough to have men at arms. So it could have been as small as twenty. It's the same word that's used for the term, a band of armed men. So where there are three million, I don't think so. And if there were, there there isn't room for them to stand up in front of the traditional ones. Now there's more room where for a quiet to put. There's yes, a large there's, there's also more room and there's the more up uh, than of the uh, you, you stand up outside and look out there and you you say, well, how many people could we get in here? How many sheep, how many goats? Uh, these, we, they, they've all got to uh, look after their flocks and their, there's not room there in the traditional place. So they had to be located somewhere else, I guess, while God was born. Yeah, I'm reading commentaries right now that say, uh, when they say, they may name a number, and it's one of those big round numbers, that that means a large group of people. And, um, you know, I don't know about that, but I am reading that also in other places. There was, uh, there's no evidence is that uh, the reason there's no evidence is there's, there was no McDonald's. There's no plastic plates and forks. You have pottery. They, did, they didn't have plastic plates, but they didn't have pottery. <laughs> and that was um, a long, long how about, time. How about waste also? Shouldn't there be evidence of waste? <laughs> I mean, that large group of people. Pre which, an animal would that. produce, uh, but that's biologically degradable, generally speaking, so 3,000 I know, but like trenches or something like that? Yeah, well that's what archaeologists look for. We may not be looking in the right place. I mean, if Wyatt's correct, we're off by about 100 miles from where we should be looking. Yes, yeah, I don't know about the evidence for the travels, but it, a friend of mine was, was with a uh, Palestinian archaeologist in the area where Israel is supposed to have camped, you know, for 40 years, I forget the name of the place right now, but, um, but they, they, sh 
Kadesh Barnea, yeah, in, the, in that region, and they, and they, this archaeologist showed them that the whole region is full of little uh, piles of stones, like like grave, they interpret it as, as graves, and they they have pottery and things, so that's an interesting little bit of information. Just traveling through the desert, because we'd like to know where Mount Sinai was. Wouldn't, wouldn't everybody like to know? Mm -hmm. Even if you can't easily get there, it'd be nice to know where it is. We don't know that. One more question. Yes. Uh, I've been wondering, and maybe you can help me with this, but uh, the Lord fed them with manna from heaven, and they didn't like it. So they said, we want meat. What about the flocks they had? They had herds and flocks and animals, and they were they wanted meat, or was it that they uh, wanted some different kind of meat? The Lord actually sent them quail, and they 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 were thankful for it. We we keep remembering the one episode where the quail wasn't very good, but um, most of the, uh, the the quail are mentioned in the travels as a source of meat. And they thank the Lord for the quail in the sea. So they had quail. Uh, we know we know something about the quail, actually. That's not a Middle Eastern bird. It's, um, it comes from Europe. It's called the European migratory quail. They fly in huge flocks down to sub-Saharan Africa in the summertime to breed. And they're going and coming. They fly over the Middle East. And particularly if they've come across the Mediterranean, they're very tired. They fly slowly. You can knock them out of the air with a stick. And so quail is, um, they still eat quail, actually. And this was shortly after they crossed the um, sea. Yes. First, this was, first, uh, right. The first episode of eating quail was shortly after the yeah. shortly after. Right. You know, the Bible mentions also wilderness of sin. And you put it right there in the land of Philistines, uh, very close to the Mediterranean. That is either. Okay. But I, all I can tell you is that when Siegfried Horn was taking a group of 40 of us in um, taxis, non-air conditioned taxis, up and down the wadis in the wilderness of Zin, we were grumbling too. <laughs> it was hot and dusty and we were thirsty and uh, the children of Israel had nothing on us. And, and you didn't even have to, uh, to uh, walk. No, we, we were in cars. <laughs> and we were grumbling. Thank <laughs> you.